Today we will learn different methods you can use to be a crook. Method 1. The unsophisticated short-sighted crook confronts a person directly and threatens him, usually while brandishing a weapon, and demands whatever money or other valuables the person has on him. While this method is fairly popular and sometimes effective, it has some drawbacks. For example, confronting someone in person poses a significant risk to you, the crook. Even if you only pick on smaller, weaker individuals, you never know when they might be armed. Furthermore, using this direct method involves a high likelihood that sooner or later you will be recognized, tracked down, and punished, whether by the victim, a bystander, or the police. And after you've done the crime, you get what you get, whatever your victim happened to have on him, and that's it. A one-time deal, usually with an unknown prize, maybe even nothing. Method 2 a slightly better way to be a crook is to break into houses when no one is around and see what you can steal. While there is some chance that you'll be noticed and confronted, the risk is a lot lower. And the average house is likely to contain a lot more valuables than the average person carries around with him. Nonetheless, there are still risks involved and a high chance that you'll leave behind evidence, footprints, fingerprints, etc. that could later get you into trouble. Method 3 the more sophisticated crook avoids the risk of violent confrontation entirely by using fraud and deception rather than direct threats and violence. For example, you might call up little old ladies and trick them into giving you their credit card numbers, or set up some mail order scam that collects money and then magically disappears. The personal risk to you, especially the risk of being physically attacked by your intended victim, decreases dramatically. However, you might still get caught, and each time is still a one-shot deal. You get what you get and run the risk of getting in trouble, one crime at a time. Method 4 The next step up is to create ongoing frauds, methods that don't just rob people once, but that create recurring theft. For example, if you trick little old ladies into giving you their credit card numbers, instead of just having a quick shopping spree, you could set up a bunch of smaller, repeating thefts. A little old lady who gets charged $9.95 a month, which shows up on her credit card statement as helping poor orphans, is unlikely to question it. Get a hundred little old ladies to do it, and you have an ongoing cash stream, without having to commit a new crime and incur new risks every time. Of course, there is still some risk of getting caught and punished. Method 5 A far better method of theft than any discussed so far is counterfeiting. While this requires serious technical and logistical resources, it has huge advantages. First of all, there is no direct victim who will even notice having been robbed. By printing fake money, you are actually robbing everyone who uses the currency. However, not only will they not notice the difference, but most people don't even comprehend why counterfeiting is bad or how it hurts anyone. The risk of your actual victims retaliating against you is therefore almost zero. The risk of them even knowing they were robbed is also almost zero and wouldn't be much higher even if they knew you were printing your own cash, simply because most people have no idea what money is or how currency works. Once you're set up, you can create an ongoing source of wealth for yourself with very little physical risk. Of course, if the authorities find out, then you're in trouble. But aside from that risk, this would seem to be the pinnacle of the art of being a crook having an unlimited supply of completely unearned wealth for yourself while the victims never know what hit them and in fact never know that anything hit them. Method 6 The next step is only for truly sociopathic crooks who don't just want unearned wealth but want to dominate their fellow man. It's again based on counterfeiting but instead of just printing money and buying stuff with it you print money and loan it to other people. At first, this may seem counterintuitive. If you can just print as much money as you want, why bother to loan it or give it away? Well, suppose you print up millions of dollars and then lend that to hundreds of different people. They will each then feel indebted to you as if you did them a favor. From then on, they will rob themselves every month giving you a pile of money while feeling a moral obligation to do so. Ironically, because they imagine the debt to be real, as if you actually loaned them your own money, they would view themselves as the crooks if they ever stopped going along with your crime. 
In fact, you should sometimes intentionally lend your counterfeit money out to the point where you know that people can't possibly pay it back. Why? Because when they default on the phony loans of your phony money, you can openly steal their houses, cars, and other property by way of foreclosure, and they will feel bad about it, as if they were the bad guys for not being able to keep up with the payments. While you openly steal everything they have, they will apologize for not giving you more while feeling shame and humiliation. What could be better? And the more you steal via this method, the more you can expand the fraud. There is really no limit. Eventually, if all goes well, you can have almost everyone in the world feeling indebted to you. And when they default, you will quite literally own the world. And most of your billions of victims will have no idea what happened. They will all be reduced to impoverished slaves for you to do with as you please, you sadistic, megalomaniacal, sociopathic bastard. Method 7 The previously mentioned method is so effective, in fact, that there's really only one way to improve it. The only risk involved, up to this point, is that the authorities might notice and catch you before you can slip off to some non-extradition treaty country with your ill-gotten gains. To remove that final risk, take the final step and bribe the politicians to legalize your crimes. When the authorities have given their official legislative blessing to your massive perpetual fraud and even offer to send their mercenaries to protect you against your victims, should any of them ever wise up to what you're doing, then you will be the supreme crook of the world. However, you cannot accomplish this. You will never be the super crook who owns the world. Why not? Because someone else beat you to it. In this country, they're called the Federal Reserve. They own Congress, which legalized their fraud in 1913. Since then, through their politically sanctioned fractional reserve banking scam, a fancy term for legalized counterfeiting, they have stolen more trillions of dollars in assets than you can possibly imagine. The crime is so perfect that they even do it right out in the open, admitting all of the details of the scheme. And still, only a tiny fraction of their victims have any idea what happened, or even have any idea that anything nasty has happened at all. However, if something like this video, for example, were to go viral, so that the victims of this fraud all understood what had been done to them, well, what would happen then remains to be seen.